just to get everything started, how many people here have what they consider to be a legacy application at their place of work? <laughs> that's why we're all here, right? That's, that's our day job, to keep all of this stuff running. So, for all those people who've got these evil, nasty legacy applications to look after, how many people don't have any of the original authors of that code still employed at their workplace? All right. And the worst one of all, out of those applications which nobody really in your company understands how they would work, do you actually have the automation or provisioning tooling to rebuild the infrastructure that it's on? Okay, so hopefully everyone is in not too bad a state. I know at our place we've got, we've got at least a couple things that if they went down, may or may not be out of a job. <laughs> so why would anyone want to migrate their application into containers without rewriting the code itself? Right, a lot of people try and take the approach of, well, we have tens, hundreds, thousands of engineers. Let's just throw them at the problem, throw teams at the problem, get this containerized, um, and start rewriting core pieces of our code that then people start to question whether that was a valid thing to do, safe thing to do. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to do it, right? There's a lot of risk in it. Engineers are always looking for the new shiny thing. So let's, let's go and build some microservices and play with all the newest technology that everyone then forgets about and becomes legacy in a couple years. So this cycle kind of repeats ad infinitum. And then you've got a bunch of code bases that people are a little precautious about touching, you know, how it's configured, how it's set up, how it runs. Um, so a lot of people don't want to touch that and then you just kind of get this, I'm just going to leave it because it works. And eventually he's going to come and bite somebody in the, in the ass, right? Um, and the business often doesn't really want to invest in legacy because of the often pretty high cost of trying to figure out how do we get this from here to the magical unicorn wonderland of, say, Kubernetes. So to kind of go on a really pretty fast tour of let's go and find an application and run through step by step an example of how we containerize it. So the thing that I'll be focusing on primarily is how we handle configuration and older styles of configuration, typically file configuration. There's a lot of different avenues of things that you need to address with legacy applications. So this is just one of them. So this is by no means like an exhaustive thing, but it's just kind of a step through saying, like we as a DevOps community, I think have invested a lot of time and are pretty good at knowledge sharing how we can develop tools and techniques to get around certain problems in a fairly inventive way. And I just I guess want to illustrate with this talk that you know, we can use a combination of all of these wonderful things that we use and take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis to make our lives easier across the board, not just with newer projects. And highlight a couple of things at the end that will catch you out. Um, for example, one of the things that's probably gonna go wrong in a live demo, I'm almost certain of, and one of the things that caught me out on the plane when I had no internet connectivity. So, first, let's find a legacy application. So, I started my career as a PHP developer, so this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, actually, that's not true. I started as a cold fusion developer, um, and then I was a flash developer. So you get the kind of context here. So I need to find something that's been developed pre-containerization in an era where you would pick up a rack, install it, and put it on a single server, in most cases. So a lot of older applications don't assume you've got shared file systems, multiple web servers, separate web and database servers necessarily. Um, and a lot of them rely on file system-based configuration, because this was back in a time where you had shared hosting. So environment variables weren't necessarily safe or controllable. And it's going to have essentially, hopefully, if I can find one, no examples of container orchestration. Because a lot of other people have gone through and done this kind of stuff, right? But there are a lot of applications that have had no luck. So WordPress. Everyone loves WordPress, right? It's my favorite application to work on, my favorite thing that people put when they're developing PHP. Um, there was no configuration file, but that's been done. Everyone's done. So I want to pick something a little older. So PHP BB, like one of the most popular bulletin board softwares of internet hate or what's spewing flames of stuff on the internet, but that's been done. So I went to look for a bit more of an obscure bulletin board software that's largely untouched, relies on a couple configuration files. So this is an example of something where I'll have configuration for how it connects to fundamental services like the database, and then runtime settings of the application then update itself. And I'll touch on why that's important in a sec. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Applications where people didn't really understand what file system permissions were. I'll admit it when I started my career. I had no idea what these three numbers meant. Nor do a lot of people have written applications back in that time. But we need to kind of understand what we're dealing with here. 
But another key thing to bear in mind is a lot of these older applications are still in use. You know, just because the code base is old and some of the tools are antiquated doesn't mean that people don't use them and that people aren't actively maintaining them. So it's very easy to forget, I think, when people talk about like Angular and React front ends and you know the latest go of Python, Rust backends. That a lot of stuff is developed in languages that were heavily in use 10, 15, 20 years ago. Right. My knowledge doesn't extend beyond that really, but you sort of get the point that there's a lot of applications that were built using things that were really the hot topic at the time that we're still gonna need to find a way to deploy. Like this, yeah, it's probably been released I think like more since then, but I mean this code base is essentially 40 years old. And still in use by a lot of popular forums. Um, Ford versus Chevy forum is I believe one of the oldest on the internet, founded in 1999 on Ultimate Bulletin Board, ported to my VP at some point in the mid 2000s I believe. Whole lot of posts about American cars, which I'm European, half Asian, won't get into. So a majority of the configuration for this exists in two files. So config.php is expected to be set up during the installation wizard or by a developer and contains like strings that are expected to not change during the runtime of the application. Settings.php is an example of an application which is expected to run on a server with a single file system. So it will write changes back to that file and then expects to get a read them directly back, which as we know in a load file setup has ramifications. Um, even in this case, also got to bear in mind that this is not JSON or YAML or even XML. Some languages have their own custom configuration formats. So older style PHP applications because of speed of processes back then, it was quicker to write configuration as actual raw PHP in PHP data structures, which causes issues for some tooling, but you know, there's plenty of ways around this stuff. So in this one, we've got database configuration strings where the admin directory, I don't know what that's for, are there super administrators, things like that, Base, basic settings. So when the application comes up, where do I put stuff? Where do I read stuff from? Where is this, where is that? Without it, application won't speak. And then settings.php which is a bit more of a problem because this is stuff that can and will change based on settings that the admin may change while the site's up, if it's in maintenance mode or not, things that happen pre-database bootstrap. So a lot of the configuration's in the database, but there are some things that it will read out of this file. And if this file is missing, it will rewrite it, but you may then lose changes that you've made at runtime, which in a containerized world is problematic. So let's just see what this thing looks like. Is it as awful as I'm claiming it to be? Probably. So, as a lot of software I've had back then as a wizard for how you configure it, I'm just running it with a built-in local web server, blah, 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 go through, using the SQLite database for simplicity, um, and then I'm just configuring some basic things like my username, what it's called, what the board is called, generates config.php, settings.php, and you have a bulletin board. So, what have we proven here? Nothing. I've proven that this works on my laptop I've shown you the same typical kind of demo that people show you at conferences like this sometimes. Like, let's go a bit deeper. So I'm gonna run the application in a container. Let's, let's start making some steps, right, towards where we wanna go. So a lot of tutorials will make basic assumptions about what you're trying to do, i.e. the most bare basic minimum. For a lot of us, it's not really applicable to a lot of how the applications we need to maintain and run actually work. So. I would say configure this and it doesn't have memcache support because a lot of people don't care about memcache anymore, which isn't really true, I don't think. So the actual container image that I'm building this off like has a mechanism to install certain extensions. So installing MySQL support, piece of cake. Installing memcache support, weird, doesn't seem to exist. So I'm gonna have to custom compile, well, like a memcache extension for PHP, reload it, and you end up with a situation where this can be you know, a bit messy, a bit convoluted. You end up with a really big Docker file and then you start introducing a lot of layers into this. One way to get around this is to use multi-stage bakes. So bake a base image, flatten that, and then add additional steps to your application and build a pipeline on top of that. Um, why not just use community images? Um, a lot of reasons. I hate Alpine. Um, I quote it to people, why do you hate Alpine? I'm like, well, I don't know, eventually news came out that, yeah. Um, there's a lot of issues also. We use um, Oracle's Java images for a lot of stuff at our work, which magically disappeared one day because of licensing disagreements. So yeah, had to switch the OpenJDK ones, but Oracle decided to get a little upset 
started pulling support. And if you rely on community-based containers and container images, you don't necessarily know if they're going to be there or not. They can be pulled at any time. So assuming that you're using a lot of traditional provisioning tools, there's a lot of ways to bake container images with what you have, with a few basic caveats on conditional. So in my previous job, we used Packer with Ansible to build identical like-for-like -like images in Docker as with GCE VMs. Um, but there's a lot of different things depending on what you're trying to do. So another thing to consider with some of this stuff is additional environment configuration. So a lot of modern stuff is expected to run a single process that relies on a single set of configurations for a single thing. A lot of older applications rely on some libraries that may read configuration from elsewhere. Any Python developers may be familiar with Photo, which reads configuration about what you're trying to talk to, say, in AWS land, potentially from different places. You may be caught out with where this configuration sits within the image, where it's expecting it to come from. So there's things like that you've got to consider. So enough talk. Let's run it in a container. So by and large, this looks like exactly what I just showed you, OK? Not really anything particularly exciting. It's just running the same thing using a PHP image, which I built using a basic, a few basic things. So what have we done this time? It's a single container. It's still using a SQLite database, but it's just one container. So no MySQL, no Postgres yet. Um, and I'm baking configuration into that image, which is terrible for a bunch of reasons. Um, and any changes that are made to settings.php while the application is running are going to be lost because it's an ephemeral file system. So I need some way to retain any administration changes to that while it's up. So one solution to that is start looking into solutions like Docker Compose, allow me to run multiple containers. So let's use that to run, say, a database. So we bring this up, and I'm going to have one MyDB instance, one container that has PHP in it, and my SQL container. Pretty standard workflow. I tried to edit these to be as quickly as possible. Hopefully that works. And there you go. So you can see logs coming back from a couple containers, some stuff that's coming back from the MySQL container, some stuff that's coming from the MyDB container. It still works, still good. Now I've got proper separation of the container and the database. Assuming that you weren't running MySQL in a container, you've now got persistent storage on the back end. So making steps. So that's more representative of what you probably have, say, if using Cloud SQL, RDS, something like that. Um, so I'm volume mounting a directory that contains configuration into the container and sim linking it back into other places. So in theory, I've got configuration to persist, but this is still limited to my laptop. So it's still limited to the host, which is problematic. And also for fault tolerance, I've only got one instance of my BB. So if that goes down, pull it and pulls down. You know, trolls can't post information on the internet. It's terrible, terrible situation. So need to load balance it fundamentally. I need more than one replica of that container running at any given time so that trolls always have a forum to peg, spew their hate onto the internet. So there's a bunch of different container orchestrators. Docker Swarm is one I'm going to go into next. Kubernetes is, by and large, at this point, probably one of the standards. Uh, we use HashiCorp Nomad in my current place. There are, you know, there's a variety of ways you can do this, but there's lots of tools now that we have to help us, depending on your workflow. So Swarm is essentially composed from multiple machines. That's literally it. So let's do that. So we run that, and then we're essentially going to bring this up. We bring up three replicas of PHP MyDB, and then one MySQL instance, which I'll populate. Eventually, MySQL will come up and pull it on board. So looking better, right? We're getting closer to something that represents what we're looking at. Load balancing actually works in a very fundamental state. Theoretically, I could add nodes to the swarm, and I would have this running across multiple machines. But we still got problems. It still isn't going to work. So I'm injecting configuration via swarm, but what's going to happen to settings.php? I still don't have something that's consistently shared across multiple nodes. It's still kind of tied to the host. So I need some kind of network storage. Um, I can specify CPU and memory limits so that I don't overload anything else that's running on the node. So, you know, I have more control over what's happening. I could run this in a setup where there's multiple applications running on Swarm. But there's some issues like network segregation, things like that. So I need something more advanced, a little more battle tested. So let's try and deploy something actually using templated configuration. Because at the moment, all I've done is here is a 
configuration file that has these static values in it and I can deploy it to one place and one place only. It's not easy for me to change these on the fly. So I need some way to help me do that. Say if you want dev staging production, I need different database credentials, different hosts, say where the RDS database is, things like that. So a lot of quick start guides will kind of overlook how you handle file configuration, but a lot of the main container orchestrators will have pretty tried and tested ways to do this. An example would be Kubernetes, which I assume everyone has heard of. No? Uh, so config maps is probably the simplest way. Let's inject some kind of configuration in a rough file-based format. In this case, I'm just passing it in as a data structure in manifest. You can link them as files, but it looks something like this, right? It looks kind of familiar to what we're doing. So let's deploy this in Kubernetes. So essentially, we're doing like for like with Swarm at this point. Three replicas of MyBB, a database, uh, deploying them from images I control. So you can see we have multiple colors, which obviously proves that these are multiple things. All right? Looks fancy. This guy must know what he's talking about, hopefully. But you can see that it all works. It's all functional. You can see things tailing in from different places. So again, we're kind of getting somewhere. So it's the same as Docker Swarm. Uh, we're using volumes to handle stuff. So, wait, no, no, are we? Yeah, I forget where I am. Templating. So, as I kind of touched on, at the moment I'm injecting a config map with a static set of values, but I need some of those values to change when I essentially apply those manifests to Kubernetes. So I need to render them out using something beforehand so I can change the values on the fly. Lots of different ways to do this. I mean, a lot of people use custom tooling to do this. There are a bunch of different things like, for example, Helm, Customize, Capitan, Case on it, JSON on it, um, depending on your language of like orchestrator of choice. So there's a lot of different ways to do it depending on setup or the setup that you're looking to go to. There's a lot of things you can do to make your life easier and JSON on it, like we use that in combination with Levant, my current place, and it's, it's pretty flexible. It's as generic as you can get. So Helm is probably one of the most well-known ones for Kubernetes. Has a lot of drawbacks, obviously, but Typically it works with client-server model, but you can just use it as a rendering step. Say, for example, with Spinnaker, you can use it as a render step to render the manifests in the pipeline. You don't need um, Pillar installed on a cluster necessarily. Um, it's best suited for stuff that comes from the community, but you can use it for your own purposes. Alternatively, as I mentioned with setting up PHP, this is gonna be modified by the application at runtime, so I need some way to persist those changes so that they're read across multiple replicas of my BB. So the easiest way to do this is to use some kind of NFS equivalent. So we'll use Kubernetes volumes for this, and I'll store the file in there, and then it will be essentially read and written to at runtime. So let's do that. For all intents and purposes, this is gonna look pretty similar <laughs> to what we've done, but the difference is here. So instead of using file-based caching, which is problematic because the file system is not shared, we're gonna use memcache. So I'm using the MySQL and memcache Helm charts to install community-based stuff which you can and can't do. I mean, realistically, you'd probably use um, services through your cloud provider to do this or different stuff. Um, and you see that it looks largely quite familiar. Eventually, this will reload. There we go. So same kind of thing, same kind of containers running. But I have templated configuration that means I can now deploy this to more than one place with relative ease just by using template overrides in Helm. Um, so you see that we have configuration matter here. So instead of putting in two files, I'm just putting in a volume and one file. So that volume is then shared. My BB will generate settings.php if it's missing, if it finds it missing at runtime. Some of your applications won't, so you may need to look into init containers or some other way to pre-populate that if it's expected to be created and expected to be there. But it depends on your application. Config.php, as I mentioned, is created by the wizard and is always expected to be this. I have to inject it, but it does not change. But the key thing here, as you can see, is I'm using values in the Helm template to essentially pre-populate where is my database? What's the host name? What's the username? What's the password? So I can change these on the fly at deploy time, which means in theory I can replicate what I've just shown you across multiple stages, which again is getting closer to getting this in some state that we want. And a persistent volume, so we need a persistent volume claim to generate some kind of shared storage. As I'll cover a little bit later on, this has its own drawbacks because some storage mechanisms in container orchestrators don't necessarily work the same as our old-fashioned counterparts. Also something to bear in mind. 
So, what everyone I'm hoping actually came here to see, with all this long ramble that I got around to, is let's actually generate some stuff that changes on the fly. So, uh, one of the biggest problems with config maps is they don't actually update consistently when you try and roll out changes to them. So you can make modifications to that and apply that back to the cluster and it will change when Kubernetes sees fit for the most part, which is usually when you expect, but not always. So this pull request has been open for a long time now, three and a half years, but they believe it's essentially in your interest, the operator or the developer to figure out a way to handle this and it's not Kubernetes responsibility to necessarily handle it, which is fine for the most part, but it's something to be aware of. So what other options do we have? for generating configuration on the fly. Console template is the one I'm gonna to touch on today. So a lot of people will use console, say, for service discovery, for service mesh. Um, it also has a key value store in the same way that Vault has a key value store, and you can use them to pre-populate values in a template. In the same way as Helm, but instead of handling it at the deploy time, I can handle it at runtime. So I can talk to console and to Vault and pull values into this template based on changes that I make in console or Vault. So console template will have a watcher, effectively, that will watch for changes to these and restart the process or reload configuration, depending on what signal you want to send on the fly. For Nomad, for example, it's built in for console. You can either run it as an entry point, as a sidecar. I'll show you the exact method at this moment, but there's a lot of different ways you can use it, depending on your setup. So, run this, and alongside deploying MySQL and Memcache, using the community charts. I'm gonna deploy console and vault using the community charts. So that's gonna give me single node console cluster, single node vault cluster. And the only real differences at this point is instead of the values coming being injected into the Helm template, which renders the Kubernetes manifest, which I then apply to actually run MyDB. At this point, I'm gonna use console template and say, okay, I want you to run an exec, so I want you to run Apache after you've rendered the template. And I want you to restart Apache in the way that I've told you to if you detect any changes to any of the key value pairs that I have in, con in the template that I'm trying to render. So for example, if I change some Apache settings, any PHP settings, any settings specific to MyDB and config.php, it will be restarted on the fly, which I'll show you in what hopefully might be a disastrous live demo in a second. But the point is we've now jumped from something which is limited to you redeploying when you want to see configuration changes to anyone being able to update this stuff on the fly. So for example, if you want to do a master slave RDS promotion, you want to switch something from going to A to B. You want to start getting into scenarios where you want to do canary deployments, reflowing traffic, changing settings that's dangerous, disabling certain things. You get to a point where you can do that for an application that was otherwise not written to do it in the first place. Like it's expecting someone to SSH onto the server, open a Vim and start hacking around. You can kind of replicate that process using tools to do that. So you'll see here, this is how console looks and a basic overview of how the KB store looks. And you'll see that some of the values that I put in the Helm template are just stored in here. So like that is the um, core DNS or QDNS hostname for Memcache as deployed by the chart. And Vault is where I'm storing the database password. So Kubernetes secrets, which I'll touch on in a sec, are a little troubled. So let's using something proper to actually store the secrets because I don't want them necessarily to just be in the container where someone could go and get them. You'll see here my super secure password. Um, but I'm storing it there so in a way that it is encrypted, I'm gonna have to go and get it. So I need an init container to be able to talk to Vault to say, I am this application, I would like this database credential. It's like, okay, I trust you. I've been told to trust you, so let's go get it. So what are the things here? So you can see on the right, console template is essentially just replacing those values. Slightly different terminology, but it looks kind of the same. It's just fetching them from a different place. Looks kind of like this, fairly familiar for anyone that's used the KB UI. So secrets management, there's a bunch of different solutions. Like I said, I'm gonna to touch on Vault because that's the one I'm most familiar with. Kubernetes secrets are not particularly secret, SED troubled. Um, so let's use Vault. Let's use something that's generally considered to be fairly safe in the enterprise, has its own issues. Um, but what I want to show you now is the database secrets engine. So one thing that's obviously, if you get into that container, you can get that password. Currently, I'm not rotating it. You'll be able to get into that database forever. 
So why don't we rotate that on the fly? So the database secrets engine in Vault will essentially use a massive set of credentials, which there's upcoming changes to, will then essentially create short-lived lease credentials. So. Good. <laughs> I hate my life. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I know what's happening here. I know something I'll talk about in a bit. But let's try, let's try and show you something that works. So instead of actually storing the secrets in there, I'm using a secrets engine that will essentially leave, I think, for around two to three minutes, a set of credentials that MyDB can use to access the database. Um, at the point where Vault and console template by association determines that those secrets need to be rotated, say, like if I've got a TTL of five minutes or two and a half minutes, they're going to expire. I need to go get some more or not. And that's one way you can use the break glass mechanism and say, nope, affirmation's been compromised, don't lease any more. And it will try and go to communicate to Vault and Vault say, not giving you any more. It also means that if anyone gets hold of those credentials, you essentially got a limited, much more limited time window and you can run this on a per container basis so you could run it on a per replica basis and have different credentials for each replica if you so desired. So you can really associate what credentials were used, where they were used, and exactly what point in time via an old vault audit trail. Hopefully this has started back up. Nope. Anyway. So it should look something like this. So essentially instead of using my DB, my DB, the defaults that I put in during the wizard, It'll lease you a credential set that is specific to Kubernetes, specific to that application, and in this case, specific like to that pod. It'll give you a password that's been leased for a short amount of time. That's the general gist of this. So you have an application that was never ever designed to have that happen. You know, if you set a password, that's it for life. Just let it run. You'll change it maybe if you can be bothered in a year or if SecOps guys get something back. But now you've got credentials that rotate automatically for an application that doesn't use any environment variables, was never containerized, never written to be, but it's now you know, reasonably secure and best practice. And kind of console template in this example is the glue that holds all that together. But depending on your setup, you know, your mileage may vary. So this kind of <laughs> demonstrates what I wanted to show you, that those credentials will change over time. And if you try and get into the database, they will change. I'll quickly, super quickly, go over the things that might catch you up. So one issue that we run into on our place is if you containerize Java, well then experimental JVM options in versions of Java pre-10, the amount of memory it will allocate to the heap will be more than is actually available to it, so it will crash. Um, so you've got to think that some applications are built to assume that they're running on a VM, and if they're running in a container, they may not behave as you expect. Um, process ID forking may not work as you expect because Docker associates PID 1 is the entry point by default. So if your application forks a lot, how is that being cleaned up? Are you likely to end up with zombies in the container? Will your container not terminate as you expect because of this behavior? All possible. Restart display is pretty sure is what crashed the demo. So if it detects changes in the template and you say have a display of 10 seconds where your application takes 10 seconds to restart, you're going to run into a situation where there's a fair chance that all replicas will be restarting at the same time. Your application is offline. So you need to account for if we're going to trigger the restart when you detect changes to the KV stores, that needs to be longer that the probability of all the containers restarting at the same time is not the same. And then storage inconsistencies with some of these things, assuming that it's a hard drive that's bolted into the server or NFS, iSCSI, whatever, like bear in mind that some of these storage things do not work as you expect. Read write locks may not work as you expect. Just some of these things to bear in mind. So you may run into issues if you have a lot of disk IO, for example. So, found a legacy application, ran it in a container, redeployed the application using static configuration, and then got it to run using dynamic configuration. And then a few top tips. Hopefully that wasn't too fast. <laughs> Hopefully I don't speak too fast. But that's, that's it. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much to DevOps Thanks. Thanks. for having me. Thanks.